The Secrets of Technology is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Technology. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Technology, where we discuss the technology news that's important to you from a uniquely Catholic point of view. And joining me today on the panel are Thomas Sanherho. Hi, Thomas. Hi, Dom. It's good to be here. And Jack Barazzini. Hi, Jack. How's it going? Very well, thanks. So, folks, uh, we've got some interesting topics, but I want to try to keep it a bit light. This could be... We, I don't want this show to be all about, oh, things are terrible in technology. They're coming for your data. But uh, the one of the things we want to do is, is help uh, listeners have more information and the information that helps you to use your technology in ways that are compatible with your outlook on life and, and with, frankly, Catholic social teaching about uh, the importance of things like freedom from uh, oppression and, and other things like that, and, and for freedom from being taken advantage of. And so today we're talking about uh, a couple of things related to data privacy and also um, being wise consumers online. So let's, let's get started on that. The first uh, story, it's kind of a bunch of headlines, but all kind of fall into this category of uh, – the companies online are sucking up all our data, all this information about us that they're then selling to other people, and we may not know about it. And the first, the first story that I saw in this vein that that kind of brought this to the fore is about uh, a vast free antivirus. Now, if if you're a PC user, especially, I don't think there's a Mac version, but if you're a PC user, you've probably seen a vast it's free antivirus. They, they, it's an antivirus tool that you can install, and it will scan your your computer for viruses, and, and it doesn't cost anything. Well, how could they possibly <laughs> make money and get you know get by uh, doing this? Well, it turns out that they're selling your data. Uh, they're aggregating your information about you and selling it. Well, and they claim, well, what we do is we anonymize it. We 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 take you know your name isn't on it. And we we but we sell the giant chunk of data to these people just so that they can learn things about how people use their computers. But what do you guys think of this? Is this is this make sense? Are, are you know does this does that de-identification protect us? Uh, what do you think, uh, Jack? I think that for the most part, it's it's not as big a deal as some people are making. I, I would not recommend using a vest anyways, to be honest. Um, but I do not think this is as bad as people are making it out to be. They also say when you're installing it, there's an option to not include your data. It says, do you want to include your data or do you not? And you can check that. Of course, most people who are going to install it are not going to really be thinking about that, and they're just going to go ahead and install it. Right. Um, but I really don't think it's as big a deal as a lot of people are saying. It's been my go-to recommendation for people for a long time because um, it's the most graphically user-friendly and um, best uh record that i've seen of the free options out there and but this recently i think the way that they've handled this situation has been really poor and that's been that's been my big gripe about it and that's why i'm i've actually left avast i've i've used them for years um and i'm leaving the leaving them behind because of the way that they've handled this whole situation yeah one of the things that uh, I, this pc mag article uh, that i'm looking at says is while it doesn't include your name, your email, or your IP address, they have enough information about you. They gather so much uh, data that's so granular right down to the second of your activity that someone like Amazon could buy this data up and they could match it up with, say, your purchases. Oh, this person was using this device with this device ID was using our service bought, you know, at this time and, and, if someone bought at this exact moment, and this might be the, this is the same person. In other words, put things enough things together, enough bits of data together, they can figure out. Oh, this is this is this person. This is you. Now they've got your name on it, and then they can go and take that and find all the other data about you that has been in, uh, gathered by 
various services. So, Jack, how is like so from your point of view, how is this overblown? Uh, I don't think it's overblown in terms of it being a bad thing. Like, I don't think it's a good thing at all. But I think that a lot of times you'll get these stories about these companies doing this kind of stuff, and for, especially for free things, it's like what do you expect? Like, it's not a right. good thing. And I don't think that it's something that we need to let happen because it is an erosion of our privacy. But if you're going to be using something for free, there is going to be a trade-off. I right. think, I think that's a, that's a very good point is, is we've all gotten so used to all these free services that we, we are using. And we just don't think about the fact that by, by doing it for free, we're, we're giving something away usually. And yeah, right. you know, if if it costs nothing, you are typically the thing being bought and sold. Right, right. That's I mean, when I was a kid watching over the air broadcast TV, that's what I was told is like, if you don't like what you're watching, well, too bad. You're you're not the one who's paying for this. The advertisers are paying for this and they just show it. They just make the, the network show the programs they want because they want you to watch it. But you're not the customer. And it's the same sort of thing here is, is we're not really the customer for these products that they are designed in such a way they're and given away in order to get us to use them, but we're not the ones providing the money. And that's something to keep in mind. I, now I've heard, you know, people say, well, I can't afford to buy all the different things out there. What, what do people do? You know, if they can't afford to pay, you know, $80 a year or whatever for, for software that isn't going to spy on them. What, what do you think? I think it's a good idea to keep up with um, open source ventures like this and just make sure that open source ventures are staying open source, not selling something from what they're doing. And, th and that's the thing that's really bothered me about this whole situation is I really like Avast's model generally if they would get their financials in order and actually have an open source model the way that a lot of companies do where they don't make money from it. They make money from donors who support them. Uh, they have coders that are uh, assigned inside of companies, and I think they've they've kind of fallen uh, behind on the usefulness of the program in a corporate setting, and that's what's really hurting them because they can't keep up with um, companies like Malwarebytes and um, uh, you know all of the other big big name uh, antivirus mm -hmm. companies. And because of that, they don't have the same kind of support that Python, for example, does because Python's used by so many companies. Those companies also then turn around and pay people to develop Python, it, not for the company, just develop Python. And um, a lot of open source stuff works on that model. And Avast really just hasn't added back in those um, those those functionalities that allow them to be a contender with the bigger corporate um, antivirus programs. I also think they haven't really done a good job of making themselves not seem just completely annoying in the way they've... <laughs> Like the way yeah, it runs so. on your computer, like that's that's been my biggest problem is the way it runs on people's computers. Right, right. There's yeah, it's there's... always asking for you to buy, and it's yeah, yeah. 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 I I remember having to deal with that on a, on PCs is is that that constant nag, you know. And, and there's there's another element which is these companies that are out there collecting this data. They're they're they it, it's got to be very tempting to to take all that cash that they're waving in front of their face you know this is it's easy money and it's you know it's the devil tempting them oh just a little bit just just give us a little bit of data and then the door gets open and and like you say thomas it's this it's the transparency of open source of true open source that really makes this that that software uh, better for consumers because they, anybody can go and look at it and go, look, this is collecting this data. You know, we don't need, need initially have to ha rely on special security researchers to do that. Uh, so, you know, right. the, it's good. And, 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 and even those security researchers, they have, they rely on the company because they have to end up going to like, if you wanted to tear apart I'm, I'm, uh, Adobe, for example, Photoshop, right. Uh, you would have to go to the company to get the source code to really right. look at some security issue that you thought might be coming up in it. Because even even if you were uh, technically uh, savvy enough to be able to uh, you know rebuild it from from base code, it it would it would not be the same thing. And there are still things that would be missing, and you wouldn't be able to say with certainty that that it hadn't happened on your PC or that something hadn't been influenced on your end with the code that you had when you downloaded it. So, you know, you're still dependent on the company to say something. Whereas with open source, it's there. Uh, that is the code. That That's what it is. 
speaking of proprietary software as opposed to the the, the free and you know, open source software, another story that came out in the last week or so is about Ring, which is owned by Amazon. And as you know, Ring is the uh, security systems, the hardware and software where you can put cameras and the doorbell, and, and they actually have security systems now. And uh, the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, said that they tore down the Android app for Ring and found that it's got built-in third-party trackers sending data about users, you know, so, so to third to other people, including a bunch of different aggregators, but including Facebook. Facebook knows when you've opened your Ring app on your Android phone, and uh, you know when you've deactivated it. There's one company uh, called Apps Flyer. Is I think it's uh, they're getting no. This other one, Mix Panel, is getting their the most information they get your full name your email address the the information about your what phone you're you're running it on and all this other stuff and then when you're using the app when you're collect when your your doorbell is ringing and when your cameras are activated now they don't see the video necessarily but they know when it happens and that i mean that's not necessarily a problem you know it's just in in the abstract sense you know, what do I care for? They know my doorbell rings 10 times a day, but they do get more, more information. Like you, you pair that with other information that they've got about you. And then they can start to know where you are, uh, track where you've gone, when you're home, when you're not home, the places you go. I mean, it's get, it gets kind of scary a little bit, it, but so, okay. Ring is bad. So where do I go? Do I go to nest? <laughs> do I go to August? Like, if I want a video doorbell, where do I go? It's one thing to have open source software, but where's the 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 hardware that that is safe from such data harvesting? What what do we do there? What do you think, guys? I think you build I think your own. If you're, <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, <laughs> if you're savvy enough, you buy your own IP camera and just wire it up yourself. That's what I did because I don't trust a Ring or Nest. Um, but I also think people need to start putting more pressure on these companies, like if. I have less of an issue with the vast, like you still have a problem with it, but if you're paying for something, then that's a real big issue because there, right, yeah. there's no trade off there. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what I, if, if I were talking to someone who was a ring user who owns an Android phone, I'm not sure what I would say to them. Like, I don't know that I'm going to tell you to, to uninstall it from your phone, but I would certainly, you know, write some complaints, con contact Amazon and say this, I don't like this. I'm thinking of switching to another company. I um, mean, and, and and I don't know that the, even that the iPhone, which I have, is out of the woods. I'm not sure that 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 app isn't also got third party trackers. Uh, Apple does a little more to lock such things down, but they also make it harder for researchers to find out what these apps are doing, <laughs> what data they're right. sending. It's a right. lot more siloed off there. Yeah, but then you have Apple tracking you. So I mean, it's there's always <laughs> someone tracking you. It seems yeah, like. The, well, that's the thing. Um, in fact. Uh, well, let's talk about this other story that uh, came up, which I, I, I saw just today as I was uh, reading the paper, my local paper. There's a story about if you uh, are a renter, if you rent an apartment, uh, it's become more and more common for landlords to install smart home devices in renters' homes. So smart locks for your door and sensors for the, uh, you know, uh, for water damage, like if there's a leak. Um, which that makes it makes sense for a, a landlord to want to, you know, know when there's a leak in one of the tenants' you know bathroom or the kitchen, uh, if, especially if the tenant is away before it causes tons of water damage, you know, in other apartments. That's really I get mm -hmm. that uh, smart thermostats, but then you know, should they have to get permission from the 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 uh, renter? Um, what happens if the renter doesn't want the landlord to install it? Because when it says a smart lock, who's responsible for updating it? Who's responsible for the data that it collects of your comings and goings? Um, that becomes really an issue here. That isn't. That's all up in the air. But what do you think? What do you think of this? Would you, if you rented? I don't know if either of you guys rent, but if you rented, would you would you be opposed to? Would you tell your landlord, I don't want you to ins install? Uh, smart home devices in my in my apartment. What do you think? Yeah, no, we currently rent. I would not go for that. I wouldn't put one of those smart door uh, smart locks on my house, anyways. I do for things like that. I'm as low tech as possible. I just want a deadbolt. You yeah. can't yeah. hack a deadbolt. 
Right. Well, and I see, here's the thing is that I'm, I'm a, a strong believer in the fact that locks are meant to keep good people honest. They're not meant to keep bad people out. So the more high tech you get with it, the the more chances there are that something's going to go wrong. And so right. just, you know, all it's there is to, to just someone's going to walk up to that door and go and try and open it. And they're going to go, ah, it's locked. And that keeps them honest. If they're intent on getting in, they're going to get in somehow. You yeah. Know? And that's you're not going to stop them. No, no lock, uh, you know, no super safety, smart locks going to stop them. And um, your phone call to the police is just as effective as the um, as the smart lock going off and warning them. But that's and that's really what it's going to come down to. I think with a lot of this stuff, like the smart home thing, I understand some of it. But I also think at a certain point, we don't need technology in every little aspect of our lives. And it sounds weird saying it on a tech podcast, but yeah. for things like like a lock or stuff like that, like at a at a certain point, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now, for me, I have a smart lock, and it's not because I think it keeps the door more secure. It's more it's more about convenience for the family because uh, one, I can't lock my keys in the house, which right or. To put it another way, my wife can't lock her keys in the house. <laughs> this has happened. In fact, th this is how I got engaged. Uh, long story short, I we were supposed to meet and wear it to at at, at uh, a mass, and I was going to give my wife the ring and ask her to marry me uh, after at the end of mass. And then I got a call right before mass that she'd locked herself out of the out of the, her apartment, and I, we had to uh, break in through the uh, rear window, and and after we. Uh, engaged in breaking, breaking and entering, I uh, proposed in her kitchen. So, so breaking, <laughs> getting locked out of houses is a thing for me. Uh, but as our kids were getting older, I didn't necessarily want to have to deal with giving them keys and things. And so they all have a code to get in the door. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I also get the whole, yeah, that, that it introduces a level of complexity. And, you know, frankly, a uh, batteries don't die on a deadbolt lock, whereas they can right. die on a smart lock. So I ha that's another thing you have to keep up with. Um, but keys do break. So, yeah, you know, right. that's, that happens as well. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I, it, but I get also get the point. Yeah. I mean, it, it introduces a level of complexity and a possibility of hacking. It And it doesn't keep out the, you know, a determined crook is not going to bother with the lock. They're going to bust down the door or go around the back and break a window. You know, that's, it, it, it's an arms race you're going to lose uh, unless yeah. you live in a, in a Fort Knox. Well, I think all, all tech decisions really come down to that is that you have to balance the concept of um, convenience versus security. Yeah. And um, it's really interesting because you go back to the Ben Franklin quote about that, you know, the, um, a man who's willing to give up uh, a little bit of security for a little bit of convenience is going to have have neither. And uh, oh, man, I lost the quote now, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that, as he's going to lose them both, basically, is what, he, yes. is what he's saying is that is that you're not going to get you're not going to have either of them. And I think that's, um, you know, with tech, it's OK, because I think we can make that decision. I think we can balance that you know there are people that want smart lights in their houses and um the only kind of smart light i would want in my house is one that i controlled locally from a server that i have set up locally in my house um and that's just because i'm a, a diy electronics geek I, I love doing that kind of stuff and mm -hmm. i i really wouldn't think about doing it for any reason other than that and uh it's really it's it's actually not terribly hard to do there are tutorials online for how to do a majority of this stuff very easily and um and they're mostly free or low cost. Uh, if you're all the hardware is actually pretty low cost too. Yep. Uh, I've ripped cameras out of old laptops and attached them to Raspberry Pis and can use that as a ring for my door just right. as easily as I do to watch my printer. <laughs> I think a lot of I think a lot of people it's just they don't want to spend the time doing that. Like if they're not into that, they're not going to want to do it. So well, they, they don't have right, the They're willing to trade yeah. off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you guys remember the X10 controllers? I mean. Those those are a oh, yeah. uh -huh. smart home mm -hmm. controls that have been around for decades, you right. know that that were not networked to the internet and all that other stuff. I mm -hmm. don't even know if they're still around, but it's but the idea is this sort of technology has been around for years, um, but it's just become easier for non technological people to do it, and that's the right. that's the big thing. And that brings me to this uh, column by uh, it's a Washington Post column. Their their technology columnist. Jeffrey Fowler, where he writes about, you know, he spent a year try, trying to both track what data he's leaking, if you, if you get the, the analogy, uh, and, and stopping the leaks, stopping the ability for all of these technology companies 
through all of his devices from getting all his data. And in the end, he kind of, he kind of realized it's impossible. Even him, who he's a this is his full time job. He's an expert in this. He he realized like I could you know to get where I where I do, I'm not giving any data to these people. I have to give up all my technology, and that's right. just not realistic. Right. And and so he he offers a couple other options, which is a we we need new laws, data privacy laws, good ones, uh, and that's that's one point. And B, we need help in the form of data privacy. Uh, he called it like a co-pilot or data privacy specialists that work on our behalf. Um, so, what do you think of these two options? I think people also need education. I think that's going to solve a lot of it. Like, like there's little things like when you go to a website, instead of using the login with Google or login with Facebook, don't do that because that's just right. linking everything together. There's a lot of little things like that that you can do that is going to help. Right. Always, when possible, use uh, your username and a unique password uh, and 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 then, you know, use a, a password manager like we've been talking about recent weeks. Uh, right. That sort of thing. Yep. Yeah. And I think um, I think. There is a there's a reasonable field here, uh, a reasonable career field, uh, if for anybody who's interested in really learning the cybersecurity stuff, and then becoming kind of a private firm that can can do this kind of work for you, where you go in and you say, "Hey, look, I think that I've got like I, I was I'm really worried about the ads that have started showing up on X and X and X thing for me. Um, can you check out my stuff and then just charge a flat fee for it and go and and do that and then probably even get to the point where they offer a service life like like lifelock where they can keep a feeler out for you know when you pop up on one of these um, third-party uh, lists of things and if they're savvy enough about it they could even start doing the same kind of big data stuff that we're talking about with um, with a vast where they're matching data up to other data and saying hey we noticed this um, is this something you would be concerned about and then if you just got an email when you went somewhere on on the web that you hadn't expected to show up in a in a result, and all of a sudden your your you know protection company is emailing you saying, "Hey, is, was this something that happened?" Uh, you might go, "Oh wow, I need to, how do I fix that?" And then they could offer system justice, you know, use VPNs, make sure that you're uh, not giving your your uh, email uh, email address out to this, or go change this password on this particular thing. Of course, the trick then is um, you have to trust the protection company. <laughs> you do. Right. You do. <laughs> Someone has well, to watch if, the watchers. If they make a business model around being yeah. honest with it, right? Uh, right. The, you know, you, you would have to maintain that level of honesty, and and so it would be a very, very, very special case for this to be the thing that could happen. Right. But I could see, I could see room for it. I think That's you. A good idea. I, I, in fact, yeah. The uh, the the columnist uh, Jeffrey Fowler talks about this. Uh, this is an app that he started using called Jumbo um, that's free for now and it's going to eventually have a paid model. But it from your phone, it logs onto Google, Facebook, Amazon and other places and checks your your privacy settings, basically, in clear language with colorful illustrations, um, explains the choices you have to make and makes recommendations. And that's that's kind of cool. If it works like the way he says, that would be great because, I mean, I. I know how a lot of this stuff works, and I still get caught once in a while. You know, oh wait, wait, why is this setting in Facebook changed? You know that, like you say, right. if there was a if a, there was a system or software or a service that was monitoring these things, because sometimes I'm convinced, sometimes these services switch the bit on us and flick things back on that you have to go then and turn back off again. Uh, it's, yeah, well, Facebook Facebook will do that thing where they'll like reconfigure their privacy settings and they'll change things around and then they'll, they'll just reset them to the default, which is not secure. Right, and then they'll re they'll reword things to make them uh, more confusing, <laughs> so that mm -hmm. they seem to say the opposite of what they're of what they're saying. Yeah, I've 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 run into that one uh, myself. I mean, we I I don't. I mean, as this is a technology podcast, we're all people who enjoy technology, and I don't want to have to get rid of my. And it's not possible to get rid of your technology unless you want to be the Unabomber living in a cabin in the woods, you know, completely cut off from the world. We technology is a part of our life, but we need to have we need control of the of of the data, the technology. We can't let the technology companies have free reign, and that's why I kind of, uh, in addition to maybe having a privacy specialist service, 
I'm kind of thinking maybe we need uh, these laws. Now, I'm 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 not someone who runs to say there ought to be a law for everything, but maybe there should be better laws about our privacy, our data being used by this game. Not and not just you know like even with the EU where they the, we have a drop dead date when every company has to mail us the privacy you know these privacy policies only lawyers can figure it anyway it doesn't right. change anything it just means that they've all notified us in legalese well we need sensible laws that are designed to protect the individual and not protect the big companies who are going to be harvesting the data in the first place right 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 exactly. and, and that's exactly the problem is that that what we're beholden to here because of the way technology works is these companies that are multinational companies that are well beyond our scope. I mean, even, even, if the, even if every single person who owns a ring complains that ring is, you know, taking this, dat, this data, uh, it's probably not going to change anything. Right. Uh, and, and it's because they, they, they don't really care. I mean, even if they lost, if, even if Amazon lost all of the ring, uh, pe- all the people that are using ring, it wouldn't affect the company, honestly. Right. And I also right. think that there's... A lot of people who are just your average user don't really understand the implications of this. They just hear like big data and, oh, my data's out there, but that doesn't really mean anything to them, which is why I think we need a lot of education on that. And there's a lot of misinformation, which people are, are re- reacting poorly to the wrong thing. They think, right. they, yeah. th- they think that every, you know, oh, I went on Facebook and there was an ad for this thing that I was just talking to my husband about. Oh, they must be listening to our conversations and putting ads for that stuff. No, they're not. It, the, the fact <laughs> is, is it's... copy and paste thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the fact is, is you, you leak data all over the place. They know right. the sorts of things you buy and that's already. And so if you're talking to your husband about buying that sort of thing, it's because you, they, and they show you an ad for it, it's because you've looked at it in a browser You've bought things that are they they can they have enough data where they can see patterns. If you you could buy five unrelated things that don't seem at all like this. Other, uh, what was it? It was a story years ago about how Target was able to look at the shopping patterns of women of of women childbearing age women, and if they bought like these products, which have nothing to do with children or health or anything, it they were likely to be pregnant. And in fact, were so good that they were sending coupons for baby stuff to women who didn't know they were pregnant yet. I don't wow. doubt it. I don't doubt it at all. And it, that's because that's because the data and the data is valuable. That's the and that's the thing is that as as a person who's really into uh, information and and data gathering and machine learning and all of all of the ways that we can use this for really tremendously good things, um, it, it's it's hard to say. Oh, this should all just stop. It should all just 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 stop it don't do it anymore because there are so many great things that could be done here the problem is is that it keeps getting used to turn a buck and right. and the the people that are really able to implement it and to put it into practice are these huge corporations that don't i mean they couldn't care less if it's if it's you any of the three of us but they will match up those data points to a number on their data sheets and and they'll they'll anonymize it too because they don't care they just want to make the ads go to whatever that bit is and whatever that IP address is or whatever that device is right uh, that's all they care about so how much let's say Google decided to make an option where you could instead of giving them all your data you pay like a fee to use Google Docs and Gmail and all that like how much would you be willing to pay for that because I think that's a question that a lot of people like when they hear that, like they're just not going to pay for it. So they're fine with the data being harvested. Uh, how much do well, I, I, I almost flipped that around. How much, much am I worth to them? How much right. are they making off of my data? Because that's going to be what the price is. Really. Right. Um, and but like you know, a lot of people are already paying for, say, Google accounts because they they have Google apps for, you know, the business suite, the Google suite or mm-hmm. G suite, whatever they call it this week. Uh, but uh the question is, yeah, what, what, how much, how much am I worth to them, and how much would I have to to bribe them, to pay them, bribe them, pay them to stop giving my data away? That's we'll see, and that that's what's interesting to me though, because that right there shows a lack of a of a good model, because there are right. plenty of open source companies that are working in that exact model. It's free to you if you're using using it privately. But when you go to the point where you're using it on multiple servers or multiple machines, or you're connecting multiple users, you pay for it. 
and and the design there is specifically for the fact that you know we can make this work obviously we're not going to get as get as big as google having open source things but that just shows that google could do this better you right know, google could go back and uh could actually make some choices that would would make this work better but could they have gone to the point they're at by doing that in the first place I think they could probably backtrack at this point and do that, but I don't know if they could have gotten to where they are starting out that way. Well, I don't think they could, and I don't think they should. And that, and that's, I think, where you know, kind of where we kind of run into the problems with these huge companies like right. Amazon and like Google, where right. they couldn't have gotten to where they are if they if they were being if they were doing this in a way that was responsible to the most people. But the way that they've been doing it. And so, yeah, I mean, ultimately, when it comes down to it, this data collection is uh, a a model that is it's pretty nefarious. It's pretty much geared entirely towards making money and it doesn't consider the users at all. We should do a show on uh, technology and distributism sometime. <laughs> I'm with it. Let's do it. OK, well, we'll put that on the list for a, a, a near future episode. <laughs> uh, that would be. I, I'm going to need to do some reading on that, but uh, we'll, we'll we'll definitely have a take this conversation further. Uh, I'm I'm. Uh, it's a good conversation to have, and it's the one we need to have on a regular basis. Um, and uh, we'll uh, we'll. And I I like to do the, the practical thing too, is like help people in specific instances in how to secure their data in in very specific ways too. So uh, not just in the 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 broader aspect that we've been doing, but also in specific ways. That would be nice. Um, all right, so let's move to our next story of, of companies behaving badly. Speaking of Google, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Google has recently changed the way ads show up in their search results, and uh, people are not happy with them for it. Uh, if you remember, not too long ago, it used to be when you'd search for something on Google, you'd get ads at the top, and they'd be set off maybe in a box or under a different color, and it was very clear that these were ads, and then the stuff below, below that were the search results and the search, the ads were related to the search results. It doesn't do them any good to share ads for stuff that you're not searching for. But uh, recently they changed the way it looks so that there's no differentiation in color. They, in fact, they look almost exactly like regular search results, except on the left at the very top, there's a very small uh, word ad where on the regular search results, there's the icon or the favicon for the website. And so you have to be paying attention. Now, if it's the same company, whether it's Kayak, you know, say you're searching in Kayak.com uh, is the ad, and then the Kayak.com's regular web, you know, organic search link is below it. I mean, frankly, I don't care if I click one, the ad on that one because that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking, you know, and if Google makes... I, I prefer that one. If, that, if, yeah. if it's actually returning the ad for the company I was looking for, then I click on the ad because I'm like, I mean, they paid for it, right? So right. I might as well go ahead and give them the click for it. Exactly. The, and and uh, some people were saying that that was bad, but I don't know if that's bad. But what what's bad is is when the ad, it's hard to tell but the difference between the ads and the search results, and that that bothers me a little bit. What do you guys think? Does it bother you? I've been running into this a lot the past week when they changed it over. Is if you're especially if you're looking for things on like if you're working with Active Directory or anything Microsoft based, the first link at the top is always an ad to something sketchy that you don't want to click on. And they're making it harder to sift through that. So that's actually been personally annoying to me. Right, right. They're, or, they're... or if you're doing, uh, if you're learning web design, uh, there's there's a co one particular company I won't name any names that's um very good at search engine optimization and pays for a lot of ads. And so my students always go there, and it's a terrible website. It's just really, really bad, hard to read, doesn't <laughs> help them at all. And so they're always clicking on that link first. I'm like, no, guys, don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the thing is, is it, it's not the best. The, the Google's organic search is supposed to be. The, be through their opaque process of their algorithm that rises the best results to the top, supposedly, um, it's circumvented by whoever can pay the most for mm -hmm. that keyword. And that may, may not be the one that everyone else thinks is. It's not the wisdom of the crowd or even the wisdom of the machine learning. It's the wisdom of the m mighty buck. And... Again, I don't mind if the ad is up there as long as it's as long as it's clearly an ad. And this is part of something that that people are talking about called dark patterns, which is these ways of designing the user interface of various things that uh, are 
almost deceptive or designed to trick you into doing something that you may not want to do. Uh, another example of a dark pattern is if you've ever had like dark mode on a phone and you you get um, a pop up and there's two buttons to click and the one that benefits the app or the company is very clearly able to see and the one that does that would be better for you and not the company is maybe darker and gr and the 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 type is smaller and gray uh, or you know, or sometimes it's like pop ups where it's like are you do, do you want to continue to receive our newsletter yes and then the the dark pattern uh, is no I prefer to remain uh ignorant of all good things and you're supposed yeah, to click, right. click that you know or or just or just something as simple as every time you click um okay in the app it's on the right side 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 and then the one time you want to click no they've switched them yeah they just flipped the buttons i've seen that so many times in that oh man that annoys me <laughs> or the seven download buttons when you're trying to download a piece of software exactly oh yeah ads that say download on them yes that's another another a version of that uh so this is a dark pattern they're they're making the ads so again i think we're in agreement it's not it's not a it's not terrible that they put ads at the top it's that they're just making it harder to differentiate ad from actual result right right and i don't like i don't like it when the response to that is well they're still clearly labeled ads you know they're not <laughs> Every, everybody knows they're not you know yeah. you're not fooling anyone by saying well they're still clearly labeled ads obviously it has the word ad but come on yes there's a lot of gaslighting that goes on in this uh pr communication that they do um yeah uh, it, so i generally use duck duck go as my search engine of choice because they don't do this <laughs> right. uh, they're and and that they keep they don't collect data and all that other stuff that we've talked about before uh so yeah it's the the way to the way to deal with this is to does not use the services that that do this. But Google is obviously making billions of dollars off of ad revenue, so you know whether whether we just have to be savvier consumers and be aware, and that's why we're talking about it here on this podcast. So uh, let's talk about some other headlines that are out there, and some let's get some good news. All right, uh, the U.S. Justice Department has filed lawsuits against uh, the a bunch of robocaller companies, companies, U.S. companies that enable robocalling. So we know that a lot of the robocalls that we get originate from overseas, and so it makes them hard to track down and, and put out of business. But uh, the Justice Department says that they, uh, there are American companies which are cooperating with these overseas companies, and so they're going after them. Uh, which is great. Well, so what do you think of this? I think it's great. What do you guys think of this? Is this, is this a, a, a chaotic uh, quest here to tilting at windmills? What do you think? I think it's similar to that thing that Trump signed a couple weeks ago, the yeah. the new law. Like, I don't think it's going to really do much. Okay. They'll find a way around it. Yeah. I just, I don't, I don't really like, I, I, I dislike robocalls. I, I, and, I'll, and I'll be honest, I, I just, robo, robocalls are terrible, but I've been getting some lately that, just infuriate me because it's it's this one where it's a pre-recorded voice and they ask for a specific person's name and then you say no there's no one here by that name and then they launch into well we're calling everyone in the area anyway so you could help us out and it's like oh <laughs> no you did not just do that <laughs> you know and oh, it's wow. like it, it it wastes it wastes time but it also like why would i ever it, and it's and it's a charitable organization that's asking for money doing oh. this so why would i ever give your organization money if you opened with a lie like you yeah. oh the first thing you did was lie to me right and now you're gonna ask me for money of course i'm not gonna give you money are you are you ridiculous <laughs> but you know why they do it because it works because I'm, I'm enough sure people yeah. still give money and these companies who run these at these fundraising campaigns tell these these nonprofits. Yeah, it you know I know it seems bad, but it works. It's like yeah, but it's bad. <laughs> like have a conviction of, of your of your ethics. Don't do it, even though it seems like you, you get more money for it. You're alienating people. Yeah, that that's a paddling. That's a paddling. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just don't answer the phone unless I know who's calling at this point. Honestly, I let it go to voicemail. That's no, that's yeah, that's it. <laughs> here's what I've run into, which I can't I haven't been able to figure out a way to stop it. My wife is getting spam texts from not from uh from uh phone numbers but from uh I think they're coming in over the email gateway and I haven't mm. been able to figure out how to block it uh it I've I've installed a couple different apps that promise to do something but they're she's still getting them 
and I, I haven't been able to figure out what to do. It's always a different email address, or, or sometimes it's an email, sometimes it's a, it's a like that one four one zero 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 short code, right? Which right. I mm-hmm. think is the email gateway to to the text, the SMS. And that's system. their iMessage, right? Uh, well, she has an iPhone, but it's I think they're all green bubbles. I think they're all oh, okay. They're not from iPhones, so it is iMessage, but it's it's not com- coming over the uh, iMessage network from Apple. <laughs> So it's just, but it's like, it's, it's infuriating and she's getting, they're disgusting, these, these texts. And I don't like the fact that my wife has to see these. And I don't like the fact that my kids could possibly see these on her phone, like on a notification, but she doesn't want to turn off text notifications because I might be texting her, you know, or her mom. And, and it's just, it's so very frustrating. So um, I, I hate robocalls. I hate the spam text. It's just so, such a pernicious uh, pox on our society. Oh, there's my notifications going. <laughs> you probably heard that in the background. Speak of them, and there they are. <laughs> the uh, the squirrels are running through the backyard. Is what they're doing, and so well, it sets off my alarms. <sighs> Don't get me started on the fact that it can't distinguish people, <laughs> squirrels from people. Uh, but uh, anyway, so the I I I I think you're probably right. This is probably a drop in the bucket. It's probably you know they'll just find other ways of around it. But just I like to see them spank these companies anyway <laughs> as much as they can <laughs> i think i think we all as as the human race we need to stop uh stop doing any business on the phone when the person calls us yes yeah if, if, I agree. if someone has called you do not do business with them period it, if they're calling you because you know you want to get together and hang out or you want to have a conversation it's fine but if they're asking you for money or they're trying to sell you anything no I that's do, just that's the answer. That's what I have started doing. I, I've I have turned off ring on the iPhone. You can say you can say don't ring for unknown caller. So I've blocked all unknown callers. It, it's still they can still leave a t- uh, voicemail. That's that's still part of it. But my phone doesn't ring for unknown calls, so I don't get robocalls anymore, which isn't really nice. Uh, un- unless they they fake a, a contact, but but really it's 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 it's, it's stopped almost everything. Um. But uh, I don't, I, I don't, I don't talk to, like, I talk to my mom on the phone because my mom's yeah. in her 80s, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? And my, you know, my brother, so I don't do, like, you're right. If I get a, a, a solicitation via a phone call, I don't care who you are, I'm not giving you anything over the phone. That's, I'm not going to do it. Send me something in the mail. I'll throw it away. The ones I don't <laughs> understand are, like, I... I looked at this college like seven years ago and I requested information from them, which was a mistake because they still call me every single day. It's like they're a legitimate <laughs> school, but I've not been answering the phone for seven years. I'm not going to start now. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a few like that. Yeah. You gotta, at some point, there's got to be like a cost analysis on this stuff and a return on investment of that kind of thing is just, you know, yeah. what, what are you what are you doing? <laughs> like, who who is watching your money? Seriously. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, there's a home improvement company. Like they, they, they're trying to sell us energy efficiency, and they've been sending this letter to my wife for like four years. Once, you know, once every couple months. In fact, actually, I've got this other thing. This company, this uh, mortgage refinancing company, that sends deceptive letters that look like they're coming from the government every week. Uh, mm. Every every week sometimes more than once a week i'm like i you're wasting your money like, stop sending it you're just wasting your money because i am not going to reply i'm not doing business with you anyway uh let's let's move on to the next headline the next one is a fun one uh at the uh oscars which i don't watch cuz i think award ceremonies are silly but at the oscars the director taika waititi who uh, directed such movies as thor ragnarok uh and jojo rabbit uh, he won an Oscar and he got, he got up there in front of, uh, I think he was giving an interview afterward. And one of the things he asked for was that the writers guild of America needs to ask Apple to fix their keyboards. Yes. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I could not agree with him more. No, I, I'm guessing right. that Taika Waititi probably got a very nice brand new MacBook pro 16 inch in the mail, uh, the, uh, in the next few days from, from some PR guy at Apple to say we have, so here it is. But, uh, I think it's hysterical that, you know, to think about, because if you think about it, most of these Hollywood writers are all on their MacBook airs every day, writing their scripts <laughs> On their other Macs and those really terrible uh, uh, laptop keyboards that Apple's had for several years. So um, if if they weren't already 
fixing it with the new keyboards. They probably would be doing it now, given the bad publicity they got. But uh, uh, so, Thomas, you have a Mac, uh, a MacBook, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. With the bad and keyboard. The- uh no, it's it's actually still got physical keys, but it's like they're the they're still the really thin ones that like you know they don't feel good when you touch them. So yeah. I've I've always I've you know I'm a I'm a mechanical keyboard guy. That's I you got to have the, the it's so got to click. It's yes. got to can't click. work. Can't type on anything else. No, yeah. <laughs> well, and it's I, I mean I'm I also have a 1910 Kent State uh typewriter that's ta 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 oh, nice. ding <laughs> uh, that whole number, uh, and I love that thing. Oh my gosh, writing on that thing is an absolute joy. It annoys everyone else so much, but it is a pleasure to it's write part on of the that thing. thing. Exactly. <laughs> Could you imagine working in an old timey newsroom back in the day with, when there's like 25 of those all going at once? Man, that's just <laughs> and and you can't put headphones in to start listening to your iPod because well you know there was nothing like that. <laughs> at the time. Exactly. Phonograph right next to you. There you go. <laughs> Hello, my baby. Hello, my dog. <laughs> uh, and then another fun one. You know, we, everyone hates likes to hate on Flash. Remember Adobe Flash? Kids ask your mom. But the you know, Flash was <laughs> you know out there for years. In fact, it only, it was ubiquitous. It was there were websites that were entirely Flash based. Most restaurant re- websites were entirely web uh, Flash based for at, for some reason. Uh, Flash was everywhere. And then along came Steve Jobs and the iPhone and killed Flash. <laughs> I mean, basically, uh, the iPhone w- wouldn't run Flash and neither would the iPad when that came along. And Steve Jobs refused to put Flash on either of those devices. Uh, and because everyone wanted their websites to work with this hot new device, they stopped using Flash eventually. And Adobe has has finally uh, killed it. And in fact, it will be dead in every web browser by the end of this year. I think I don't think you'll be able to run it at all, uh, which yeah. should, which would be interesting. You shouldn't be running it anyway. Like if it's it's you know I mean I know that there's some websites that you still have to run it on. Right. But... <laughs> Was Homestar Runner Flash? Yes, it, it was. was. Okay. Oh, well, yes, it was. I was going to mention that. I'm glad you brought it up. And that's <laughs> why we we're talking about that. it. <laughs> so uh, somebody has come up and said, "Hey, you know what? You know, I know we're all we're all sad that you know we're all not sad that Flash is going away, but you know we've got all of this stuff, all of this creativity, all of these things like Homestar Runner or the um uh the the flying hamster game. Do you guys remember that? Yes. Da, 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 yeah. da, da, da. I, I still get that going through my head once in a while. I'm like, I wonder where that game is these days. Someone should make that for the iPhone. But uh, th- so this, oh, what was the name? I had it and I've lost it. But uh, the, these, these guys want to preserve all of this flash content somewhere online so that it, it doesn't get lost. And that's one of the things about, technology is when it's based on a platform that's proprietary like this and and the technology gets left behind all of that content gets left behind too sort of like you know old, like we just saw old phonographs you know when, right. when phonographs went away and not i don't mean just like record players but like the old timey photographs yeah if all of those were gone we all of the those records that were made for them would be unplayable now they're analog, so someone could probably create something to read them. But in the digital era, we'd have to recreate some way to read the, the digital files. So they're they're looking to create a an archive of this online. So, but so I was just you know I was going to ask you guys if you had any flash uh, stuff do you think that should be preserved. Obviously, that, Home Star Runner, Home Star Runner, definitely, yeah. definitely in there. <laughs> uh, there's there's some other games that that I've played from time to time um, that that have just been really good games that were made in flash and it's because flash was so easy. It was so low barrier to, to entry and you could hack something together in it real quick and it looked decent and behaved well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if, if you want to do that now, you have to learn HTML five and CSS and actually know what you're doing and make right. it work properly. And it gets really hairy fast. I also miss the kind of like the, the DIY punk attitude of a lot of that old flash stuff. Like you don't really get that as much anymore. Yeah, that's true. There was what was the one where the uh, the little guy in your user interface running around destroying things. And you're trying to click on him to stop him. It was a, that was a flash uh, animation. I remember. But the, even like games like desktop tower defense, like all of mm-hmm. that genre uh, started with a, a game called desktop tower defense, which was a flash game. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and then uh, I'm trying to think of some other ones or like crush that. the castle, crush the castle. Yeah, we wouldn't yeah. have had Angry Birds maybe if we hadn't. 
at Crush the Castle first. Uh, so th- there's a lot of good stuff out there like that. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other ones. Uh, we mentioned the 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 hamster game, the flying hamster. Um, there, but there's also content like Homestar Runner, which were creative things, not just games, but uh, animations. There was, uh, mm-hmm. in fact, I remember uh, there was a the BBC had uh, a vast library of Doctor Who Flash. It, w- it was created for the to go along with the the TV show when it rebooted back in 2005, and it was all this Flash content that yeah, was, it was sort like of comic booky kind of yeah. the moving picture kind of stuff. Yeah, that was real. That was really cool. I think Marvel did something like that too around the same time. And um, I, you know, I mean, I think there's a lot of stuff out there. I was really proud of the BBC. They have um, they have one of the best typing programs. So if anyone's interested in a, in a uh, a typing program for their kids, it's called Dance Mat Typing, and um, it's a fantastic way to learn typing. It's got this um groovy little Elton John style goat who walks you through how to put your <laughs> fingers on the keyboard and uh and everything and the kids love it the kids uh, that I teach they actually do a really good job at it and they love it and it, it's really helping them learn how to type um but it was in flash and they have since then they have really worked to revamp it and make it uh html5 compliant and uh it has it had so many issues for the longest time but it was still the best program i had found to to teach these kids how to type so i was still going to it even when it was doing all this failing so i was sending in bug reports every time, every time <laughs> i would sit down at the end of the day here's a bug report of this this thing happening uh but I, they did a really good job of updating it to the newer uh, to newer frameworks and I'm, I'm not sure how they did it exactly but i think it's an html5 but it's a really good uh it's a really good example of how some of this stuff could be redone and um you know, it gets a new face, but it also just stays true to the original intent of what it was. And I'm pretty sure Homestar Runner has moved over to HTML5 too in the past couple of years. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, do you know if they've converted all the old content uh, as well? I, or I'm not sure. They yeah. might have just saved those videos and re-uploaded them just as videos. Just videos. Yeah, yeah. But then they'll yeah. work sometimes and mm-hmm. you don't get the fun of having to troubleshoot Flash. <laughs> yes oh the fun and the updates uh, that's why yeah. i love those updates on a constant basis all right last headline before our picks of the week uh this is uh one that goes close to, gets close to home for me uh this eight-year-old girl in britain uh wales i should say uh to be more specific managed to rack up over 1800 dollars or 1450 pounds in credit card charges after, through in-app purchases in the Roblox game on her parents' iPad. Uh, and her parents say, well, our precious child isn't to blame. Uh, the, the child, it's, the BBC article says she added her own fingerprint to Touch ID so she could make the purchases without asking one of her parents. Mm-hmm. And she didn't realize that it was, she was spending money, that she thought it was all free. Yeah, the kid's not to blame, the parents are. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, very much so. Oh my gosh! If even my four-year-old did this, and I, 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 I could see her making a mistake and making a purchase. Yeah. But my six-year-old, if if this was something that he did, oh no, sir, that he would know. He would know every step of the way that he was spending my money, and he mm-hmm. would be paying for it for quite a while too. <laughs> well, because that's not going to fly. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm going to tell you right here. I'm going to come right out and say it. I think these parents put the kids' fingerprint I in the Touch ID because they were tired of her coming to them asking for them to unlock the the device with them. Like bingo. It, that's probably what happened. Yeah. My kids are constantly doing that to me with my iPad. <laughs> Daddy, can you unlock your iPad? It locked. I went to the bathroom. and came back. It was locked. Yeah. 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 Here you go. Go. Go away. You know, it's constant, but I'm not going to put them in the thing so that they can unlock it and not only get into spending money, but also get into my other stuff that they that I don't want them in. Um, I've trained them. Uh, I've got really old iPad 2s and stuff that that is their, theirs to do with as they will. There's right. nothing on them uh, that are locked down with the parental controls. They can't buy stuff. But there's there's Apple Arcade only runs on my iPad. And I, I and there's a couple of games like What the Golf that they love, which is a, a you, you ought to love it because it's a really hysterical game. It's really fun. But the, but when they want to use it, I'm like, OK, you have to sit there in the same room. Right. Exactly. And, and uh, no walking on hard floors. <laughs> <laughs> and no. And if you leave the app, you stop what you're doing. You tell me, you know, like they're, they're trained. But these parents, the, the parents, oh, you're right. The parents are to blame. They. They put the kid's fingerprint ID in there. There's no way for the child to add her own fingerprint to the fingerprint ID unless unless she had, at eight years old, the password, the master password mm-hmm. for the iPad. 
that right. might have been possible too. But again, that's on the parent. Right. Well, and I, I think generally speaking here too, you're talking about, uh, I mean, $1,800, that's a lot. I, that is. It, it's, it's not easy. I mean, even in Roblox, it's not easy to rack up that kind of money. Okay. And I think a, a lot of people without kids this age are looking at this going, oh, well, she's only eight. No, 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 no. Let me tell you, people. My six-year-old knows. Yeah. My six-year-old knows when he is buying something. And he can look at the screen and see that there is a dollar amount that's going to it. And mm -hmm. he knows what a dollar amount is because we've given him a dollar amount to go buy something from the store. And he's been super disappointed that he was short, you know, a certain amount of money. So <laughs> if you don't want your kids to do this kind of stuff. Right. Give them physical cash, make them go buy something, teach them what the value of the stuff is, and then yes. keep an eye on them and don't give them access to your whole phone. My kids know when they're spent, when the thing pops up and wants them to buy, when it costs money. I mean, it's, it's, uh, the, we talked about dark patterns. Yeah, maybe they use a little dark pattern in Roblox, but Apple's, the, the design on the iOS, it's still pretty darn clear for an eight-year-old that you're, that this is going to cost money. And you're right, 1800 bucks over a three, I think it was a three-day period, right? Oh, my gosh. I didn't, didn't check their I bank didn't, account I didn't at all, so I want to know. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> why did well, the credit did, card flag? Did it not flag throw it? up? Yeah. Yeah, did, yeah. Why did it not flag uh, on there? I mean, I have been wrestling with my... Um, with my cable company lately because my bank flagged them because they were a day late charging my account one month. And it's like, <laughs> come on, seriously. Yeah. So the, according to the, to the BBC report, she spent between each transaction was between 99 uh, cents and 1999. So that's, a, that's a lot of transactions. I mean, at, for, uh, to add up to fourteen fifty over three days, how much time was she spending on this iPad? Let's ask that that's question a good, that's too. That's a great question. Yeah. yeah. So parents, bad parents. <laughs> she probably just had it with her all day, and they weren't keeping an eye on it. <laughs> well, no, I'll tell you. I'll tell you the, the primary mark of the bad parent is you're blaming someone else immediately. Yes. Yeah. That's that right there. I can tell you that's that's an issue. Yes, I've I've blamed myself plenty of times. I've been upset about it, but I I still know that I'm responsible. <laughs> All right, so let's get to our uh, picks of the week. Then uh, we'll, we'll end on the, on a high note with some really good picks. Uh, Thomas, I'll let you go first. All right, so my pick of the week is a program called GIMP, which sounds really funny, but it's a great program if you've ever been interested in doing anything in Photoshop, but you don't want to fork over the uh, insane amounts of cash that they want you to pay every <laughs> single month now to subscribe to it, um, or even to just buy the the standalone version. Uh, GIMP is a fantastic open source, and I wanted to pick something open source because I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking open source here. I want to make sure I, I uh, bring this back in, uh, but GIMP's a fantastic open source alternative to Photoshop. It does everything you need it to uh if, unless you are a professional graphic designer and then you're probably going to have photoshop anyway so if you've ever wanted to do photo edit or just play around with it it is the new gnu new image manipulation program which is why it's called gimp uh and new is an open source licensing uh, platform and um it's it's really easy to to use now here's the thing it is a professional graphic design program so when you get it it's not like uh, paint or like, uh, you know, a bitmap program that you can just start and know exactly what you're doing. But there are loads of really great um, resources online, especially on YouTube, that will teach you how to use GIMP uh, really, really well. Yeah, if you know how to use Photoshop, you'll be able to figure out how to use GIMP. It's, it, if, you, if you have a need for um, a uh, photo editing program, then, you'll, then you'll, you'll be able to get into it really quick. But yeah. Good, good choice. Uh, I try. I remember trying it years ago, and the uh, interface was kind of wonky. Have they gotten better with the interface? Oh yeah, the the interface has gotten a lot better. Um, even on Mac, uh, for a long while they were using X11, and they were having yeah. it broken out into a bunch of windows. And um, I there was a there was a bit of a of a, a turning their nose up at people who wanted the user interface to be easier because uh -huh. they were like, no, no, no. Our whole point is to be like free of the like corporatism of, of of photoshop and so they had all these windows that you could break out of everything so <laughs> they've they've backed off of that the option is still there to do all of that same stuff which i yeah. love it's fantastic no more to hippies. Be able to, like break your window out and do all sorts of stuff but yeah that's exactly what they, that's what, that's what their problem was and so so now they're back into it's a it's a really nice user interface now and it really is um a lot more it, it's a lot more similar to uh to photoshop than it was before Awesome. And they're, they're kind of gotten to that point where they've admitted, hey, that's what we're doing. We're replacing Photoshop. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a lot better. Awesome. That's good to hear. Uh, Jack, what's your pick? 
my pick, speaking of an uh, antivirus, is a Bitdefender Antivirus Free Edition. Um, for, if you're going with the free edition, it just works on Windows, um, and it's really good. I've used it for years. I've never had any issues with it. It keeps the uh, definitions up to date. Um, it's pretty much just that, a free antivirus that does not spy on you, as far as I know. You know, maybe we'll find out. But when you go through <laughs> and you install it, it doesn't have any of the stuff that Avast has, and it also doesn't bug you to upgrade constantly which is nice um but if you do want to upgrade the uh um it's 29.99 for the first year and you can use that on three devices and then they have the bit defender total security which is uh 44.99 for the first year and that's five devices and that also includes mac os protection android and ios protection oh wow that's really awesome yeah there's a free download of a virus scanner for mac so it's a i guess that's a basic uh version yeah that, yeah uh, and you and you had said Avast uses too many resources on your computer. Bitdefender is better than that. Yeah, it's a lot more uh, transparent and in the background. Like it pops up every once in a while, lets you know it's scanning, but it's not constantly coming up the way Avast does. Oh, cool, good. All right, that's like another good pick. So my pick is uh, WiseCam because you know I want a, something that spies on me in my house, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Wise is a is an internet camera, an internet uh, connected camera, but uh, that. Uh, what what I like about it is it is very inexpensive. Uh, on Amazon, it's like twenty five dollars, and it's got all the features. It's got an app that you can put on your phone. Um, it you can put a um, a SD card in the back, and then you can record uh, uh, events. So it does motion detection, and we'll start the recording, and we'll record events uh, uh, when it's activated, and store them on the card, and then you can download them with the app. And um, it can be indoors. They also have stuff to make it. You can ha put it outdoors, so, uh, which uh, I, I I I would hesitate to do that uh, for some that's not specifically designed for outdoors. But maybe that maybe okay. They have a couple different versions, but the most basic one is the they have one that pans and stuff. Like you can control it. But the the most basic one, the the Wise Cam, uh, has a pretty wide field of view. It does HD recording. It has a, has both a speaker and a microphone. Um, I I have um, a strong rule about cameras in my house. I don't like having a camera connected in my house while I'm in it. I just that's I, I'm I'm on the paranoia scale on that one. I have I have things that cover up all of my uh, laptop, uh, you know, my various uh, Skype cameras and that sort of stuff on my computers, and so I don't leave it connected. I'm going to keep it. What I do is when I'm not here, um, we're away for the day or on vacation, whatever. That's when I plug it in, so that when it when there's not supposed to be anybody in the house, it will activate if somebody is. Um, not sure what I'm going to do if I see somebody walking around, but maybe I'll catch their face. And the cops, if they if they catch somebody, they'll be able to connect the face to it, I guess. But uh, uh, it it gives me a little more peace of mind. And for twenty something bucks, it's not a bad uh, little investment. So that's um, not bad at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, it, and and it's. Um, been vetted by a lot of people as it's not like a lot of these fly by night IP cameras where you're they use off the shelf um software that's full of backdoors and bugs and stuff that can be hacked. These are th they're building this software themselves. So uh, that's good. pretty good. Yeah. And they're based in Seattle. So they're it's pretty good. So uh Wisecam. We'll have links to all those in the show notes of course. So I think that'll do it for us. Uh, what did you think of any of the things we discussed today? We'd love to hear your feedback on you know, the data privacy leaking and the Google Ads deceptions and even the, any of the headlines we talked about. Uh, we love to hear feedback from you and uh, any of your suggestions for stories or, to cover or things you'd like to hear us talk about. We we love to hear that too. And we'll, we, we've done episodes where we've talked about uh, uh, listener-suggested topics. Uh, you can let us know by commenting on this show at sqpn.com slash technology or on the SQPN Facebook page, facebook.com slash StarQuest Media, or send us an email to technology at sqpn.com. And I'll put all the links from our discussion, all the headlines, and our picks of the week on our show notes at sqpn.com. If you are not subscribed to the show, if you say you're listening on the website or someone sent you a file, be sure to subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, Spotify, wherever you can get podcasts, we'll be there. And uh, you can also listen on YouTube, we're on the SQPN YouTube channel, where you should make sure to hit the bell to get notifications of new episodes. 
Until next time, Jack Barazzini, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of technology. Thanks, Tom. And Thomas Sanajojo, thank you as well. It's been nice. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the Secrets of Technology on StarQuest.